It was actually, it was at the Global Leadership Summit a few years ago that Bob Goff, who's a lawyer and an author, stood up and proudly proclaimed that every Thursday, I quit something. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? Before you go and quit your job tomorrow, you should probably know that I think Bob Goff was being just a little bit sarcastic in this. Although it's tempting, uh, and I think some of Bob Goff's disciples have found some freedom in actually quitting things. I've heard, read about some of them who have like quit playing games on their phones. They've just eliminated the games off their phones. Or they've quit responding to like Snapchats or texts or other social media when they're in a conversation with somebody else. And they've actually chosen to like, hey, I'm just going to be with this person who's right in front of me. Amazing, right? They found actually some life in that. And, uh, and so that's pretty amazing. I actually decided I would quit something. So I decided to quit skateboarding. It was a number of years ago, and, uh, but I did. I decided to quit skateboarding. I had actually uh, gotten on my skateboard. I went down a really steep hill, and I got going so fast that I got the speed wobble. And so I bailed before wiping out, and I started running as fast as I could, and my body just ran a little bit faster than my legs. And bam, face plant on my chin, gashed wide open, ended up with stitches and a little bit of a story to tell. And that's what happens when you get on a skateboard on too steep a hill and you start going too fast. But I think it also happens in our lives when we take on too much and get in too steep of a hill and we start going too fast. We end up having to bail or we lose our balance or we risk wiping out and doing a face plant, getting knocked right out of life. And that's really what this series is about. It's about knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to so that we can avoid getting knocked out of life. Our lives are filled with all kinds of good opportunities. We don't need help saying bad or saying no to bad opportunities. We need help figuring out which good opportunities to say yes to and which ones we should say no to. In fact, a lot of life is made up of trying to balance our assignments and our opportunities. Our assignments are those things that we really don't have a choice in. That we said yes maybe to a good opportunity at one point, they became an assignment, and now they're like, they're responsibilities that we have to fulfill. Whereas opportunities are the things we still have a choice in. We can say yes or no. So many of you may be like me or will be like me someday in the fact that you've said yes to maybe a good job opportunity or you've said yes to getting married or yes to having a family. Maybe you've said yes to following Jesus or joining a church, yes to taking care of your own personal health. An opportunity for you may be an assignment for me. It's different for all of us. But once you've said yes to a specific assignment, it means that you are saying no to thousands of other opportunities that you face on a regular basis throughout your day and your week and your year. I have lots of assignments because I chose to have a family, because I'm working at a church. And the season that I'm in doesn't allow me a lot of room for new opportunities. More than I had a few years ago when my kids were little, but still not a lot of new opportunities. I know college students who have maybe just recently graduated or have just been through finals feel like their whole life is an assignment. And for college students, I just want to say, actually, your life is full of opportunities, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing to say yes to a lot of opportunities when you're young, because that's how you learn. It's a time for you to learn how you're wired, how you're made up, and, and what you're all about, and what you like and don't like but it can still throw your life out of balance. I think balance in life is all about continually recognizing and balancing assignments and opportunities as we move in and out of different seasons of our lives, as we experience maybe a crisis in our lives, or, or maybe uh, the different the conflicts that arise in our schedule during the week or the, or the month, the day, or maybe the economy changes. We have to continually evaluate and balance out our assignments and our opportunities and to, and to figure out how are we doing at this. And since there's a cost to everything we say yes to, it means we're saying no to a bunch of other stuff, then I think it's really important that we don't let someone else determine our yeses. We don't let the culture dictate what we're going to say yes to. 
We, we need to say yes ourselves. We don't let guilt or shame determine what our yes is. And there's tons of books written about this kind of thing. There's lots of self-help books. But what I want to suggest today is that God actually has a plan to help us uh, figure out what our yeses are and what our noes are, that he wants to help us with this so that we can experience more life in him. And he does this, I think, by helping us to know three important things. God wants us to know our why, he wants us to know our who, and he wants us to know our what. Now, when a new opportunity arises, a lot of us take time to, to think about at least the what. What's going to be accomplished? What am I going to experience? What's going to happen and result as I say yes? But I think our best yes results when we first take time to consider our why and our who our why meaning our purpose, why we are even here and why we're made the way we are, our who being who we're trying to please and who we're doing our what for. When we know our why and our who, then we can know our what and discover God's assignment. Now, I don't love the word assignment. Right? It feels just too like responsible and like assignments aren't fun. It's like I got to do an assignment for school or whatever. But I learned when I was about 12 that God's assignments are actually different than that. In fact, I, I heard about it um, in 1980. I heard about these two brothers. They were actually ex-convicts who uh, were given the task to save this Catholic home they grew up in. I want you to take a look at their story. Well, yeah. Well, me and the Lord... We got an understanding. We're on a mission from God. We're putting the band back together. Again. No way. We're on a mission from God. Matt, me and Elwood. Putting the band back together. Would it make you feel any better if you knew that what we're asking Matt here to do is a holy thing? You see, we're on a mission from God. They're not going to catch us. We're on a mission from God. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome, right? I mean, it looks fun and adventurous, and you're not going to get caught by the police, right? Because you're on a mission from God. Now, I show you this because I just, I just want to remind you that God's assignments for us aren't drudgery. They're not meant to be drudgery. They're meant to be an adventure. It's meant to be fun. It's actually the way that he has wired us to find the most out of life. Jesus had an assignment from God, and fulfilling that assignment meant he had to know what to say yes to and what opportunities to say no to. And I was thinking about that. In fact, when Jesus, he fasted at one time for 40 days in the desert, 40 days of fasting, and then we're told that Satan came and tempted him. It means Satan came and gave him all these opportunities, like he gave him the opportunity to feed himself and end his hunger right then and there. He gave him an opportunity to prove who he was to the rest of the world right then and there. He gave him the opportunity to avoid having to go to the cross. And Jesus said no to those opportunities because Jesus knew his assignment. And knowing that assignment gave him the power to overcome very real human desires and temptations that we all experience. Jesus had to say no to some other amazing opportunities in fact, Jesus had to say no to healing people sometimes. Jesus actually left some people unhealed. There were people who needed ministering to that Jesus said no, he couldn't minister to them. People invited him to come teach, and sometimes Jesus said, no, I can't go and teach there right now. He even let his best friend die at one time. These aren't easy decisions. But Jesus was able to say yes and no because he knew his why, his who, and his what. 
And I can say that with confidence because Luke tells us this exact thing in a passage that he writes. It was actually, uh, Luke writes about this temptation in the desert that Jesus experienced. And then the next story that, that Luke tells us is that Jesus was in a synagogue one day and he was teaching. It's the first time in Luke's story that we actually see Jesus publicly teaching. And this is what Luke writes. He says, Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is Jesus declaring his earthly mission for the next few years. And in it, he names three important aspects that will keep him grounded and keep him focused and on target to fulfilling that mission. Jesus lists his why, he lists his who, and he names his what. First, the why. The passage that Jesus chooses to read is from the book of Isaiah. We can actually read this same book, this same message in our Bible, the first two-thirds of the Bible in the Old Testament is the book of Isaiah. And we can read these words. Jesus intentionally chooses these specific verses of of what God had spoken to the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And he says, today, these words are fulfilled as I speak them to you. In other words, you want to know why I'm here? This is it. This is why I'm here. My why is found in God's word that was spoken years and years before. My why is established in God's word. I'm here now because he has anointed me to do this very thing. Now, anointed. I want you to, to, to know something, that when the people were listening to this, that word anointed, it conjured up an image in their minds. Right? The image was of a priest taking oil and pouring it onto somebody's head, and then the oil flowing down over the person's beard and then overflowing all onto the floor. And so it's like God pouring his spirit out onto Jesus. It's flowing all the way through him and pouring out onto everyone else around him. That's what his assignment was. Those who were with us last fall, you may remember the big bucket that we talked about at the gathering in our opening uh, series, how it stays under the fountain at the falls and it fills with water and then it overflows out onto all the kids and the people who come running to get splashed by that big bucket. That's what anointing looks like. That's what it is, where where you're filled with his power and his spirit, and it overflows to others all around us. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are anointed. You are filled with that same spirit and love to be poured out onto all others around you. And like Jesus, his followers find their why in God's word as discovered through their relationship with Jesus. In fact, the original passage that Jesus refers to speaks all about that. And Jesus would speak about this all the time. He'd say things like, as my Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And Paul picked up on this and wrote in his letters time and time again, listen, you've been created for a purpose. In fact, God created you and he created these works in advance for you to do. This is why you are here. He has created and empowered you to complete his unique assignments. That's where we find life to the full. Do you know your why? My why is not about me. And your why is not about you. Our why is is about God. We were created by God and for God. In fact, Paul says it this way in Colossians. He says, for in him, all things were created. All things have been created through him and for him. 
And Acts echoes this, for in him we live and move and have our being. In him we find our life. A few months ago in, in February, world leaders and adults and children of all walks of life, they came together to pay tribute and honor, last respects to Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists and pastors uh, of, of all time. In fact, um, it's estimated that Billy Graham uh, shared the good news of Jesus with uh, 200 million people in his lifetime. And Billy Graham says this about his life. He said, my one purpose in life is to help people find a relationship with God, which I believe comes from knowing Christ. You could say that Billy Graham knew his why. And amazing things resulted from him knowing his why. I have a little piece of paper that I put up on my desk at, at work and at home and in my bathroom. And John, the keyboardist, told me that I should probably put the seat down and asked me if I could do that before the next service. Apologize, I wasn't able to get that done. Um, but I, I try to look at this all the time. I try to review my why, and it's something that I've taken a long time to develop, and it's gone through a number of different uh, um, uh, kind of uh, wordings of this. And so the one that's on the mirror says this. It says, to love, encourage, and coach others to thrive in God's work in and around them. And I've since simplified it to just simply say, to encourage others to thrive in the life God is bringing to them and through them. And I've, I've, I've formed this by engaging the Bible, by reading the Bible and paying attention to like passages that just stand out to me and like, like speak to me in some way. Like, yeah, I get excited about that. Or I hear stories or see people in the Bible and say, I want a life like that. That's what I want my life to look like. And then I've, I've had people, uh, coaches and mentors, who have spoken words to me about my effect on them or on others. Or sometimes people will write me a note of encouragement and say, thank you for, for doing this in my life. And I'll pay attention to those things. Like, what are they saying about who I am? And I've added all that up, and I continually review this. I sometimes have retreats a couple times a year to review this, to know what my why is. And it's, it's, these aren't like really complicated you know, things that you need a lot of training for. Anybody can do this. You can figure out what your why is. Do you know your why? It makes a difference. It makes a difference in, in every single day. For example, my wife and I are trying to get our house ready to sell. And we want to downsize a little bit and find something else a little bit smaller. And so um, we knew we had some house projects, so I asked a realtor to come over. And um, the list went like that, right? <laughs> and I like to work with my hands. And I like to do some of that stuff. But I could get lost in that list if I forgot what my assignment is, what my why is, that my why is to be encouraging others. And I can get lost even in the midst of doing those things where I don't feel particularly like encouraging somebody and I feel like saying some other words instead. So I remember my assignment and what my why is. God wants us to know our why. He's not hiding this from us and we find it in his word by engaging the Bible with Jesus and with others in conversation. Do you know your why? If not, do you know your next step to figure out what your why is? Jesus knows his why, he also knows his who. And uh, by knowing his who, I mean he knows both who sent him and who he is here to serve. And he says this right in the middle of this passage. He says, it's God who sent me. He sent me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Now, there were people in the audience that day who were like, yes, this was good news. This is his mission. It's good news for all of us, actually. But there were some in the audience who didn't care for it. And they would argue with him about it, and they would push back on this. But knowing and naming his who, I think, helped keep Jesus focused on his assignment in those times when people complained about what he was teaching, in those times when, when, they, when they didn't like what he was doing, in those times when they didn't like who he's hanging out with. Jesus was clear on his who both who sent him and who he had come to serve. 
And God sent him to be with and to serve people who were in need of freedom and restoration, people who needed help and encouragement. And God sends us to these same who's. Now, do you have any people pleasers in the room besides me? I mention this because I think it's easy for us to get off track. When opportunities come up, somebody presents us an opportunity, it's easy for us to say yes because we think this is an opportunity to please this person. Maybe this is an opportunity to win their approval or earn their respect or their love or to start to build a reputation. And sometimes that results from saying yes to some of those opportunities. But more often than not, what I find out when then that's my motivation is to please other people. I say yes to way too many things. I get overextended. I get overcommitted. I start running too fast, and pretty soon my body's going faster than my legs. Bam, I wipe out, face plant. I'm miserable. The other thing that happens sometimes is when you start thinking that you know, you're here to please other people, sometimes those people also think you're here to please them, which isn't always a great situation. And Jesus avoided this trap because he knew his who. His only concern was his father's pleasure. He he served an audience of one. He worked for God, not for others, and not for himself. Jesus knew knew that it was God who sent him, and he also knew who God sent him to serve. And it wasn't who many other people were expecting him to come to. It wasn't the people that they were expecting him to hang out with. And so he ticked some people off, and it cost him something. Do you know your who? William Wilberforce, many of you know his story. He met Jesus when he was 26 years old. He was working in Parliament, uh, the English Parliament at the time. And um, he committed his life to Jesus and committed himself to serving God from that time forward. It was considered social and political suicide. And then he met this guy named Thomas Clarkson and some of his friends. And they introduced him, and he came face to face with the horrific realities of the British slave trade. William Wilberforce could not sleep. It bothered him so much. He was a wreck. It was just breaking his heart. He could not stop thinking about these men and women who were being brutally dehumanized and oppressed. William Wilberforce found his who. And he spent the next 20 years of his life fighting for and eventually overthrowing the British slave trade because he knew his who. Do you know your who? Life is all about the who's in your life. God sends us into homes, into families, into offices and businesses and classrooms, onto teams and into clubs all filled with who's. Who's are our need of freedom and encouragement and help? Who's are our need of coaching and guidance and teaching? Who's who, who need forgiveness or maybe need to learn to forgive someone else? Who's who need second and third and 50th chances? Who's who maybe we overlook or who's that we don't even necessarily like? Who's who are struggling in their marriages? Who's who are tied down by shame and guilt or sin? Who's who don't know that God loves them and God has a purpose for them? Knowing your who frees you to run and be a blessing to these people in a broken world. Now the other thing knowing your who does, it frees you up to say no without having guilt. So uh, ladies who are maybe in high school or guys who, you know, prom seasons come up and Maybe somebody's asking you to go to prom and it's not really your thing and you can just comfortably say, sorry, you're not my who, right? It's problem solved. <laughs> Sunday morning, somebody comes and asks me to go serve in the nursery. Sorry, that's not my who, right? No guilt. I can just say no to that. And the last thing I want you to know too is that the who's aren't necessarily just the people right in front of us, the people that we know, that the who's in Jesus' mind is, is both local and global who's. And in our church, I'm happy to say that over 300 individuals and families have found who's in Haiti and Mozambique and other places of the world 
who are blessing their lives as they sponsor these children and these college students who are in need financially, who are in need in so many ways for support. And not only are they blessing those families, those people, but they are being blessed in return. Perhaps Jesus is calling you to know a new who today. Finally, do you know your what? Know your who, know your why, know your what. Jesus proclaims his what in this passage. He says, I'm here to proclaim good news and freedom, to recover sight for the blind, to set people free and show the world that the Lord's favor is here, that God is with them and God is for them. Jesus could do anything. He had every spiritual gift available to him, but I think he's looking ahead at the next few years of his ministry and he's saying, this season of my life, I'm gonna focus on these specific spiritual gifts to bless this world. I think he calls out his gift of teaching. He calls out his gift of miraculous healing. He calls out his gift of mercy and his gift of shepherding, of, of leading people into new life. He's saying, this is what my next few years are gonna look like, and I'm gonna use these to be a blessing to others. Do you know your what? I know Dave spent a little bit of time on this last week. I just want to share a story uh, of one young gal I know, a friend of mine, a college student. She graduated this weekend. She's been serving at a church um, as in their youth uh, program. She was their youth leader for the last couple of years. They found out how talented and gifted she is, how amazing she is. Um, so they moved her into some other positions too and taking on more responsibilities. She was leading worship. She was leading some things uh, in the church with the office and everything. And they, they were so much uh, in love with her and enamored with her gifts and abilities. They said, we want to help you get connected with a seminary. And she went down to Dallas and she interviewed and she got accepted and she got scholarships and grants. Full ride to the seminary. Like graduate, she's going to go to seminary. Her life is set. And she comes back and she's getting ready to sign everything, get ready to, to, to prepare for that. And she sits down to think about it a little bit beforehand and pray about it. And she realizes suddenly, this isn't my what. This is someone else's what. This is not my passion. These are not the specific gifts I want to pay attention to right now in my life. This is not what God is speaking to me where I'm going to find life. It's another direction. She says no to this amazing opportunity, opportunity of a lifetime. She doesn't have another opportunity that she knows of that's out there yet. But in faith, because she knows her what, she's trusting Jesus and she's taking that step. Last thing I want to say about knowing your what is I want to encourage you to pay attention to your passions like William Wilberforce did. I think we get mixed up sometimes and we think our passion is all about the thing that brings us the most life and that we feel the best when we're doing this. But the word passion in Latin actually means to suffer. And it's, it's a passion that's born out of our own suffering or born out of the suffering from others. So I met this guy uh, a week and a half ago. He was in the parking lot. He was walking in, do some business, and, and uh, I just started a conversation with him. And he reveals to me that he has this foundation that helps families who have children who are born with club feet to get the help that they need. And it's like, that's kind of random. I mean, how did you come up with this? He says, I endured seven surgeries myself when I was a kid to have my feet fixed. My own suffering led to this amazing foundation for people in need. What is your passion? What does is, what is your heart break for? Where have you seen suffering in your own life or someone else's life that might speak to your what? If you don't know your who or your why or your what, I want to encourage you to make a commitment today to figure out what that is. We have classes. There's a class going on right now that Carla Chestnut is leading with some others. Uh, Kurt Patterson reminded me the journey is a class that's offered every fall. But he said, if we have people who want to take it right now, I'll lead them right now. We'll do it right now this summer. Don't wait. You can do that right now. And if you already know your assignment, I want to encourage you to take some time and get alone with God and just ask him, how's it going? How are we doing at this? Is there maybe something else or some other way this might look in my life? Let's pray. 
Father, uh, you are such a good God. This is the way I believe you designed us and you've made us and you've created us. You've given this group great privilege to be not just in the front row of seeing you at work in this world, but to actually have a role in that and to, and to be part of how you're blessing this world, how, how you're showing the world that your favor is here, that you are with us and you're for us. God, I just don't think there can be anything better than that. So I ask that you'd help us to take that time to consider this invitation from you, to, to, to take the step to join in it with you, and then that, Lord, we would seek you in your word and in conversations with you and with others, that you would reveal to us our why, our who, and our what, that we might be about the life that you set up for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.